Welcome, Matt. No wonder. Eli couldn't find, he was looking for Amanda. <laughs> He's like, they're not on yet. Panicking, but no, very good. Um, welcome, guys. Welcome, everyone. So we're letting everyone in right now, and we're also starting it up on Facebook Live. Um, cool. I'm excited. So let's get the party going. Um, hold on a second. Let me just just uh, move my screen around real quick and if that works there. There we go. Perfect. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're letting people in. It's 631. Today is Thursday. We're already in October, October 5th. That is it's yeah, time flies. People are putting up their uh, October Halloween pumpkins, all kinds of stuff. So if everyone just uh, wants to click on OK, we're, we're, broad, we're broadcasting this live. And um, I'm really excited about this workshop. Look at 6.30 p.m. And it's called Year in Tax Planning. Nobody wants to talk numbers around this time of the day. Uh, nobody wants to talk about taxes this time of the day. But it's more than that. We're talking about money, how to keep the hard-earned money that you actually uh, go in and bust your butt every single day to, to accumulate and grow. Uh, so I'm very excited uh, for this uh, workshop. And, um, and before we, we go into uh, the workshop and who our guests are, we have a couple slides for you. Uh, Eliazar, our, our guest host, he's on. Uh, if you could just kind of uh, show us, Elizar, the, uh, uh, do we have, if you want to go into the next slide here, and so we could show everyone, there we go. Um, so if I want everyone to know that we have two workshops a month, different topics, right? Uh, tax benefits of owning real estate, first time home buying, home selling 101, military benefits, renting versus owning, uh, ADUs for beginners, uh, budgeting your way to $1 million. And we do a lot of financial literacy workshops for kids as well, uh, as well as adults. Uh, so if you want a list of all the workshops that we do, you want to get emailed that list every single month, you can just scan this URL code here and on your phone, your camera, and then you could just uh, sign up for that. It's free, all the workshops. And we have awesome guests as well, just like we do tonight. And then um, also, I wanted to thank all the realtors um, who made this possible. Here's everyone. Um, so whoever invited you to this one, please thank them because this is a ton of value that they're giving you. And it's not costing you anything. So uh, thank you to everyone and everyone's clients who's on, who are on right now. Um, our Right. What more? Do, what do we have? Anything more, Eli? And by the way, since this is free, um, if you find benefit value from this workshop tonight, please leave us a review. Um, that's all we ask. So scan this. Go on to our Google page, and Eli Eliazar just uh, texted the it in the chat. And just review us and say, hey, we jumped onto a workshop put on by Left at Temple Properties, powered by EXP, and um, tell us about uh, what you learned or if it was beneficial. And please leave us a five star review with positive comments. That would be awesome. All right. Without further ado, I want to uh, introduce our guest host. Or first, I guess I got to talk about myself a little bit. <laughs> I'm Voltaire Lepe. Top 1% realtor in all of San Diego County, born and raised in San Diego. Um, I manage an office here with uh, 20 uh, plus associates, realtors that do their own business. And I've been in real estate for a while, 20 plus years. And I have 52 uh, rentals here in San Diego, 52 doors that I've accumulated over the years. Um, became a self-made millionaire by the age of 32. And I've done a lot of deals, small deals, big deals. And we've taught financial literacy to hundreds of kids and we help out our community. We give money back to our community um, and a lot of time back to our community. So uh, we're happy about that here. Okay, now, without further ado, 
here's Amanda Han and Matt McFarland. So um, the way that that we actually I learned about them at first is because uh, some years back, you know, I was tired of paying taxes. I was paying taxes. I was a real estate agent, still am. And I was making good money as a real estate agent. And for all the real estate agents out there, if you know of a real estate agent, the way it works is you make money as a realtor and then you go and spend that money and you don't even know that you got to pay taxes on it. Right. Until the next year, when you meet with your accountant, you get like a big tax bill and you're like, what is this for? And then all of a sudden you're behind the eight ball and you start to, you know, the IRS sends you a, and the California FTB uh, starts sending you bills saying, hey, you owe this money. And there was a point in my career where I was just like, man, there's got to be a better way. I'm paying all these taxes. And in my case, um, you know, I've paid over six figures in taxes, you know, on an annual basis uh, to different entities. And I was just like, there's got to be a better way. And that's when I ran across a book that was called Tax Strategies for the Savvy Real Estate Investor. And I read that book and I just remember reading like, what? Like you could do things to pay less taxes legally. And that's kind of when I first got introduced to who they are. and. Um, sometime later, I, you know, I always remembered them and I would, you know, read their book. I would be like on vacation and, um, and I just said, man, I got to get a hold of them. And then, uh, one time I did reach out to them and, um, they had a waiting list and I was like, what? Like I have money, like I'm ready to pay. And, but they had a waiting list, but that's how popular they are. That's how sought off, uh, after they are. And I, I finally uh, was able to get on a waiting list and I was able to work with them. Um, the advice they gave me saved me a lot of money uh, to the point where nowadays uh, the IRS isn't sending me bills, um, but they're sending me money now. They're sending me actual like checks that I get to cash. And just a quick shout out to them. Um, I bought a, a, a property earlier this year and I was like $40,000 short. And it was crazy because I was just thinking like, geez, you know, I'm short. I got to figure this out. And then the very next day, I get a check from the IRS for like $43,000 from the IRS. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I just deposited into my account, wired the money to escrow, closed the deal. So I appreciate you guys for that. Um, but again, you guys are well known. Um, if you guys want to give yourself a proper introduction, uh, please do welcome Amanda and Matt. Thank you for being here tonight. Thanks, Voltaire. Yeah, thanks, Voltaire. Thanks for <laughs> thanks for implying that we control what the IRS sends out of money. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a <laughs> that's a great story. And um, yeah, I didn't know you were on our wait list, but uh, I'm glad that we uh, started working with you a couple of years ago, and, and super excited to be here with everyone. Uh, to talk about year-end tax planning, um, especially for real estate investors and realtors. Um, so yeah, I know, like you said, you know, people aren't really interested in talking about taxes uh, this late in the day, but we'll try to keep it a beat and try to uh, kind of go through the content as fast as we can. Um, can you give me control to share my screen? Of course, we'll give you control right now. And by the way, if you guys want, feel free to turn on your... Um your camera so we could see your beautiful smiles. That's okay. Um, plus it gives <laughs> us more energy because we see your guys' faces and um, it's 6.30. So we, we need all the energy we could get, but here you go. <laughs> you have control now. Yeah, give, give me one second. I was going to confirm. You said we're doing this for free tonight? Is that what you said? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's free. <laughs> oh, okay. And by um, the way, uh, uh, let me tell everyone, um, Matt and Amanda, they're awesome. They're worth every single penny but they just don't deal with anyone for multiple reasons. Um, but one of the reasons is, um, hey, they're very sought after. They have high-end clients. So I recommend everyone take notes because they are um, what some people would consider expensive, um, but they're worth every single penny. So whatever questions you have, type into the chat and take as many notes as possible because they're hooking us up tonight. 
Yeah, for sure. Make sure you take advantage of our time today. Um, but yeah, I mean, besides being, so our firm is Keystone CPA and we specialize in working with real estate investors on how to use real estate to save on taxes. Um, and, you know, besides uh, our business, we are also investors ourselves. So uh, like many of you, uh, real estate is one of the major asset classes that we utilize to build our wealth too. Yeah. And, uh, you know, similar to Voltaire, obviously we've, we've been in the industry of uh, 20 plus years as well. We both got our start at one of the big four accounting firms. Kind of, you know, I remember having my aha moment. I was probably 24, 25 years old, two or three years into the industry and reviewing, you know, gentleman's tax returns, probably in his 60s. He was retired. You know, all he had was real estate. He was making six figures plus in cash flow. But when you, you figure out, it, but not paying any taxes, but when you figure out that, like, oh, when you add back the depreciation, you kind of figure out what he is making in cash flow. Uh, that's when the light bulb went off and there's something here to be, to be said. And uh, that's kind of what this guy started his guidance down this path of wanting to help real estate investors is kind of what we like to do. It's uh, you know, probably 90% of our clients are real estate investors, whether it's full time or, you know, working the W2 job, investing in the side too. So it kind of runs the whole gamut. So yeah, I'm excited to be here. Yeah. For those of you who are realtors or real estate brokers, I mean, you know, you're like in the perfect position uh, to be able to kind of combine both worlds of earning income actively through real estate commissions, but then also building your wealth through real estate in terms of investment properties. So whenever I meet realtors, I'm always like, you have to invest in real estate. You're kind of, you know, you're already doing a big part, the hardest part of the job. Um, and uh, so yeah, we'll turn, talked about our books. Um, we wrote two books on tax strategies. And if you think it's super boring, I kid you not, people tell us they bring it on vacation. They read it on the beach. Um, so definitely check it out. You get Some it. Some people told us they read it in the bathroom. I don't know. I don't know if that's a good thing or not, but. Um, you can get it on Amazon, on Baker Pockets or uh, Barnes and Nobles, basically anywhere books are sold. Um, all right, so enough about us. Let's get into it. We want to start this out with a pop quiz. And the reason we want to do that um, is to make sure we know who's paying attention, guys. So you can just put your answer in the QA box. And why don't we do this, Voltaire? Whoever answers the question correctly, the first person to put it in the chat box correctly, um, then uh, we can send them a copy, a signed copy of our book. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. So that's why that way people who are uh, not excited to participate. Well, all right. So read the question. So which of the following celebrities went to prison for failing to file tax returns? <laughs> uh, Tim McGraw, Chris Tucker, Fat Joe, or yours truly, Voltaire Lepe? <laughs> oh, man. All right. All right. Let's see. Who's a Cuba Gooding Jr.? <laughs> this is so funny. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So we got a lot of answers before. People, people jump in the gun. So they, yeah, we, we didn't yeah. give that. We're supposed to give that instruction that this is like kindergarten. You're supposed to. Okay. Alexandra Clark, you got it. You're Fat Joe is the answer. And please type in your mailing address and we'll grab that later on. Make sure we send. You don't have to share that with everybody, obviously, but you could share that to, uh, to Voltaire or something. But yeah, did anybody, did anybody actually guess, guess you? Uh, that, that's the important thing nobody here. Said <laughs> no, nobody, nobody's willing nobody. to go out on a limb there. We're good. We're good. They wanted to book. Uh, all right. They wanted to do it. Yeah. So um, just so you know, you I mean, you guys named a lot of people on here that are not even on our list. But <laughs> most people on this list, besides Voltaire, uh, actually had some tax issues. Uh, so this is a pretty you know difficult quiz, but we what we were going for was the person who actually went to prison. So even though Chris Tucker, Tim McGraw, they had tax issues, you probably hear about them uh, from the celebrity perspective. But Fat Joe, the rapper, for those of you who are fans of uh, of Joe, um, he was the only one who actually went to prison. And why are we sharing this information with you? Well, no reason at all, really, um, except to say that everything we talk about tonight are strategies that could be applied in certain scenarios. Um, it doesn't mean that it will apply in your situation. It doesn't mean that is the advice for your situation. So when you hear something that sounds good, don't run out and implement it. Make sure you write it down and talk to your tax advisor about whether or not that's something good. And then you can take it offline as to whether you think Voltaire went to prison for other things or not. You know, I mean, it's, that could be, that's still up in the air, but. Never. So yeah. Well, yeah. He is in Vegas and the night is still young. Yes, so. yes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, you know, one of the things we kind of, one of the, you know, everyone's going to kind of probably know this in the back of their mind, subconsciously, they kind of know it, but we're going to, we're going to put it straight in your face, right? As to, you know, what are we talking about? Why is this important? As Voltaire mentioned earlier, how do we keep more of that hard-earned money that you're making, right? 
uh, because we do think that taxes are that silent killer. Um, so, you know, what do we see? <clears throat> Highest federal income tax right now is 37%. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, every dollar, if you're in the 37% bracket, it doesn't mean every dollar you're paying 37% because we have those graduated scales, right? But Again, if you're in the highest bracket, you're losing the next dollar, you're losing 37%. Uh, for those of us who are lucky to live here in the state of California, uh, you can be paying up to 13% of state income taxes. There's other states as well. New York, um, I think, has up to 10%, if I remember correctly. Uh, Hawaii. There's, was in the there's some state. other big ones, too. Um, you know, payroll taxes. So if you have your own business, you're working for yourself, you're self-employed, you're paying 15% in payroll taxes. Yeah, this is a big one, right, for all of you right. who are realtors uh, that uh, kind of catch people by surprise. They didn't know, in addition to federal and state taxes, they're also paying uh, into a Social Security and Medicare taxes. Surprise. <laughs> uh, you, investors, we all know, kind of when you sell real estate, you're paying capital gains taxes as part of your, your income tax you pay every year. That can be up to 24% when you add in the various pieces. And then if you happen to pass away and you don't have a good estate tax plan in place, you could be paying up to 37% on the the appreciated value of your assets, right, in your estate. So, you know, you kind of put it all together. Obviously, you can quickly see that um, you could be losing 50, 60 percent of your next dollar to income taxes uh, if you don't plan accordingly and plan proactively and kind of put the right things in place. Yeah, it's really interesting because uh, there's a, a organization that they're called taxfoundation.org. And so every year they do research to see how much are we actually losing to taxes. And year after year, the results have been that Americans lose more money to taxes than we do on food, clothing, and housing, combined, which is pretty scary, right? Because I think for most people, you think housing is your biggest expense. But when you look at all the different pieces... I was going to say spouse, but I, that's... Uh, that, was my, oh, that was my inside voice speaking there. <laughs> but when you put all the different pieces together, um, you can quickly see how taxes are biggest expense. And uh, for those of you who own your home or invest in real estate, what's missing from here? Property taxes, right? We haven't even talked about property taxes. Or whenever you go to Costco and you buy stuff uh, or Target or wherever you go, there's sales tax. So none of those are even included in these analysis. Um but to take a look at kind of a, a pie chart to see someone who makes very, very technical pie chart, obviously. Yeah, someone uh -huh. who makes five hundred thousand on the left. After those various taxes, you have about one hundred ninety nine thousand dollars left. And again, especially for those of you who are realtors who own your own business, um, when you add in all the different pieces, it's pretty shocking to see what you actually end up. And so what that means when it, with respect to minimizing our taxes, right, is that the higher tax rate we are in, the more important it is for us to make sure we maximize our tax write-offs. Why? Because if we're losing 50% to federal and state taxes, then every $100 that we spend, we're going to save 50 bucks in the form of cash when we're writing it off on our taxes. Okay? So, um, We'll kind of start tonight's conversation before we get into like the heart of the year and planning, start with a little bit of the basics in terms of just like, what can we do to maximize our write-offs? And when we look at maximizing write-offs, I think sometimes people think of like, oh, what can I buy? What can I spend money on? Do I buy a car? Do I buy this? That's not really the way we should go about it. We should really be looking at what are some of the things we are already spending money on already? And what are some of the ways that we can shift them from being personal expenses into legitimate business deductions? Yeah, I think as a um, you know business owner, real estate investor, uh, a lot of times there's a lot of expenses that we don't forget about, right? We, you know, as an investor, you, you, you most of the time you don't forget to deduct your mortgage interest, your property taxes, your insurance for your properties. Those are just some common things, right? Business owner, you know, you're paying rent expense for an office or your, uh, you know paying salaries to somebody or you're paying commissions for real estate transactions. Those are the big ticket items that most people don't forget about. Right. But it's more of these kind of these, uh, we'll call them overhead costs of running a business or being an investor, being a business owner that I think a lot of people forget about because they're just, I don't know, various reasons, right. They, maybe they don't know that they can deduct it or uh, they're just, they're, you know, bookkeeping and accounting is not up to date. So they just say, screw it for lack of a better term. Right. It's like, is that the technical I, I think that's, the, that's like it. the pie chart. Um, but yeah, it just kind of gets overlooked a lot. And I, you know, I think we're, we're going to kind of go through a few of these, right? It's like professional development, you know, you're doing education and training, maybe you're going to conferences. Those are things that we'll see. We'll look at 
clients, you know, come to us, work with us in planning, and we'll look at their tax returns and look at their documents at the end of the year. And it's like, hey, I know you you went to the bigger pockets conference, you went to this or that, right? I don't see these expenses on your, you know, on your on your PL. Uh, so those are things that get missed a lot. And, and again, these are probably stuff you're already spending money on anyway, right? You're you're going to these events, you're going dues and subscriptions, uh, business meals, travel, all those kind of things that can add up very quickly uh, when you sit down and think about, um, you know, yeah, what did I where did I spend money this year? Mm -hmm. And one thing I do want to bring up, uh, it's really important for us to address up front is that when we talk about these business deductions, you know, if you are a real estate investor or if you're a realtor, you are a business owner in the eyes of the IRS. So even if for some reason you don't have a legal entity, you could still take these deductions nonetheless. Um, because I think there's a lot of myth around like oh, wait, I just started. I don't have an entity yet or for whatever reason, my 1099 is coming to my personal name. Um, that that does not prevent you from claiming these deductions, provided that these deductions are, are being incurred because of your real estate business. Um, another big one, I think, for uh, investors and also realtors is home office, right? I, I think, I don't know, I know almost no real estate investors who rent an office space to manage their rentals. Most people handle or deal with their rental properties from their home office. But I think same for a lot of realtors. You know, you might go into the broker's office to like meet with clients and things like that. But if the majority of your work, like what you're doing is from your home office, then that's a legitimate home office deduction. So make sure you capture it. Um, I know we just kind of showed like three or four of these on the list. There's actually over... Uh, there's like over a hundred different tax deductions that you can take advantage of. So we just want to make sure that you're capturing all of those things. Um, another big one is car expenses, right? I mean, as realtors and real estate investors, we all use our cars for business. So make sure you're tracking the business use percentage of that car. Again, regardless of whether the car is in your entity or in your personal name, you could still take the business use as a deduction regardless of who holds title to that property. Yeah, and so, again, these these are expenses that can add up very quickly. We see this all the time where it's, you know, again, maybe some, oh, this might be like you know, a couple hundred bucks, but obviously you add up, this could be five, ten thousand $10,000. And again, if you're, you know, in the highest tax bracket, I mean, that could, you spent, you added up and it was $10,000 of deductions you weren't taking. I mean, that could save you, you know, $5,000 in taxes, right? Yeah. Do you have a question, Walter? Yeah, I was going to say, um, going back to that car deduction. So if you have one rental and you drive there to collect the rent and to fix certain things, you could, during that time that you use the car, you could write it off. Is yeah, right? and it's, yeah, for sure. And, you know, a, a common misconception is like, I can only deduct my car expense if I'm driving to the property. But, you know, as a landlord, there are a lot of different reasons why you drive for your real estate, right? You might be driving to uh, go to Home Depot pick up some stuff. You might be driving to a local real estate meetup. You might be driving to meet with a lender or your CPA or, um, you know, a broker, right? So there's all these different trips. So it's not just necessarily limited to me driving to the property, you know, once or twice a month. Uh, but yeah, definitely make sure you track those uh, miles because they are legitimate business deductions. Okay, thank you. Uh, and, you know, this year, I think for some of the, those of you who are like realtors, um, if you're doing real estate full time, odds are you're using your car, a pretty significant portion of it, at least for business purposes. Right now, we still have 80 percent bonus depreciation for this year. Yeah. So, you know, if you're um, in the in the market, you need a new car and it's going to be used predominantly for business, you know, 80, 90, 100 percent. I mean, from a tax perspective, at least. Uh, generally speaking, your best bang for your buck is if you, you're buying a vehicle that does weigh over 6,000 pounds. Uh, that can add up to, you know, again, if, you know, if it's a $40,000 vehicle, meets those parameters, you're using it 80, 90, 100% of the time for business. I mean, that this, it's not unreasonable to get a, like a $30,000 write-off in that first year on something like that. So um, definitely something to think about as you're coming up on year end and having that conversation with your spouse, trying to tell them that you need a new car for, for business purposes. <laughs> A December to remember. I think that's what Lexus calls it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, that's good. I wish I, I wish I knew you guys sooner in my career because I drove the same Jeep uh, for uh, way too long. I think it was 13 years until it stopped working. And uh, I knew there's some tax planning that I could have done to get myself a, you know, better 
uh, vehicle. A, uh, a quote unquote subsidized vehicle, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Government so, subsidized. Yeah. Uh, Vanessa needs a new car too for anyone who's uh, thinking wants, of wants uh, to buy her one. Who's, yeah, Christmas gift. All right, let's shift gears into year and tax planning because that's kind of the main topic we want to talk about. And um, I think it's good to kind of start with a, a, a definition of like what is year and tax planning? It's not April yet. Why are we even talking about taxes? Why are we here? Yeah, you know, so as much as uh, kind of give you a sports analogy, so I'm a sports fan. Amanda is not a sports fan. She'll she'll try and tell you that um, I'm a pretend sports in the fan. Uh, in the sports world. It, you know what happens during the first three quarters of a basketball game or the first 75, 80 percent of a football game or a baseball game doesn't matter. That the only thing that matters is the score when the clock runs to zero. Uh, I guess technically that could be true, but we'll leave that aside. So. Year-end planning is a lot like that, actually, is that when we kind of coming up on year-end, um, you know, you have time to make moves and figure out things you can do to kind of cut your taxes right now. Because once we get to December 31st, once that clock strikes midnight, turns to January, for the most part, your numbers are already decided, right? There's a few things you can still do after year-end, but you do have a lot more options in terms of uh, strategy you can put in place um, before the end of the year. And that's kind of what the importance of kind of doing you know, proactive year-end tax planning. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just like, you know, in the basketball game, what the scores, where the scores stand at the end of the game determines who the winner is. So in the tax world, where your numbers are as of December 30, 31st, generally determines how much taxes you will or will you not pay, right? So if my profit is uh, 500,000 versus 200,000 at the end of the year, that's a big difference in terms of what I pay for next April. And that's the reason we're talking now um, you know, some people might think, oh, wow, you know, it's uh, October, so we're three months early for year in planning. Um, actually, the opposite is true. You know, we're like nine months late. We should have been planning in January, but year end is so important because even for those of you who haven't planned, we still have the next three months to figure out some moves that we can make before the end of the year. So uh, let's start with, um, you know, kind of our uh, one of the main topics when we look at year in planning is how do we tax efficiently take profits out of our business? Yeah, I mean, so one, one idea that comes to mind, you know, for those of you, especially agents, realtors, probably a lot of you have S corporations, you're running kind of your business through an S corporation. Um, best ways to kind of take money out of S corps is a couple of different ways. You are, the IRS does require you to pay yourself a reasonable salary. Now you generally speaking, you're gonna want that to be as low as you can reasonably justify. The reason being is when you pay yourself a W-2 or salary, you do need to pay yourself payroll taxes. So, um, but the less you can justify paying yourself in salary, the lower your payroll taxes will be, and the more you can take out as a dividend or a distribution, which is not subject to payroll taxes. So that's kind of where the the uh, the play comes at year end in terms of uh, you know minimizing payroll but maximizing your distributions. Yeah, so like if you're someone, you know, let's say you netted $100,000 of um, commissions income, if you earned it inside of a regular LLC, uh, odds are you're going to pay federal, state, and self-employment taxes on the whole thing. But if instead that $100,000 was earned in an S corporation, as an example, then you're only paying payroll taxes, like Matt said, on the payroll you take out. The rest of the money that you take out is distributions. You don't have to pay payroll taxes. So um, you know, I think on average for someone who makes about a hundred thousand net profit operating as an S corporation, we typically see tax savings of up to maybe seven thousand dollars per year in taxes. Uh, and in many instances, you know, the more profit you have, the higher the tax savings. So, meaning if you're at three hundred thousand of net profit, then oftentimes it's even more beneficial for you to be operating inside of an S corp. Um, and again, the, you know, like Matt was saying, the significance of year end is that you do have to run payroll before the end of the year. If you run it afterwards, um, it's considered late. And so IRS does have some penalties for running late payroll. Yeah, a great, a great tip at your end is, you know, if you do or if you are running businesses through an S corporation, uh, get your financials up to date, kind of have a conversation with your, your tax advisor because they can, they can kind of do a quick run through, look through your financial statements and see if there's any other tax issues that might come up with respect to your financials or could be, uh, maybe your company had a loss for some reason, you know, you expand the business, maybe had a tough year, whatever it may be. Uh, maybe you took loans, you know, a couple of years ago from the idle loans, the PPP loans, and some of those issues might come up in your financials. Those are all things you kind of want to have just a conversation about so that there's not any surprises come, you know, March next year when you're going to file your tax. Like, 
Oh, hey, I wish I would have had that conversation eight months ago, right? <laughs> yeah, one thing, um, so we were talking about S-Corps because, you know, for most, for those of you who are realtors, we have active income. Usually we're talking about some kind of a corporation. Um, but for those of you who have LLCs, let's say we just have our rental properties are all held in LLCs. Uh, really important to understand for LLCs, you can take out money whenever you want. So if there's cash flow built up, you can take it out. It could be before the end of the year. It could be next year. There's no tax difference at all. Um, and we also don't have to worry about payroll. So with respect to rental income, that's the benefit of having rental real estate is that um, the vast majority of the time, there is no payroll tax concerns. Uh, so something to keep in mind, because we do see that as a question like, oh, do I need to run payroll for my, my rental stuff? Uh, next big, oh, did you guys have a question? Did you have a question, Voltaire? No, I just said that's a good point to differentiate oh. the, the rental income, no payroll tax. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the next thing we always look at for year end is income deferral. Yeah, I mean, when we talk about income deferral, this can cover and this covers so many different areas, right? I mean, but the general idea being that you look again at, you know, the kind of concept is, well, if I'm going to be in this, you know, let's just say the off chance that you're in the exact same tax bracket one year to the next, right? If there's a way that you can defer receiving money between December 28th and January 5th, then all of a sudden you've pushed the taxes due on that income back an entire year, right? Even though you, you only received it five, seven days later, right? So that can happen a lot of things. That can happen a lot of businesses. Maybe you uh, wait to invoice somebody until January 1st or something, you know, so there's no way they could pay you before you're in. Maybe you are um, forcing your, your your clients to close later. <laughs> and sometimes, it, maybe, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, it's really interesting. I mean, this is obviously uh, more controllable in a real, I mean, in, in a transaction where you're the buyer or seller, right? You can say, hey, yeah, uh, you know, I'm selling this investment property. And I don't really have a way to offset the taxes. So I want to delay my closing until January because then it'll give me a whole year to strategize with my CPA on how I'm going to offset this huge gain on the property I sold. Um, you know, on the realtor side, it's a little bit harder, right? Because you're, so, you're kind of at the mercy of your client who's maybe selling the property. Uh, but it is also a strategy you can share with your clients who are selling. You know, sometimes clients are hesitant to sell because they don't want to you know, deal with the tax and maybe they don't want to do a 1031 exchange. So that could be something you work with your clients on and say, hey, you know, we can close on this property in January of next year. And then you have all of next year to work with your CPA and how to offset the tax. Or it could be a situation. I mean, I was talking earlier about having the same tax bracket one year or the next. What if your tax bracket next year is going to be substantially lower, right? And well, now all of a sudden, instead of paying 40% on the dollar, if you defer it, maybe you're only paying 20 cents on the dollar next year, right? the same exact thing. So these are the kind of things to think about as you're coming up on year end and what's happening in your world and, you know, in, in business and investing and kind of you know, that, that realm. Um, on the flip side for year end planning, this is the exact opposite when we talk about expenses. So we, you know, we said we're going to defer income, but at the same time, we look at accelerating expenses. So accelerating means like, hey, what, what do I already know I'm going to have to pay in early next year? And can I pay that before the end of the year? So, uh, you know, any kind of like license renewals, if you have marketing fees that are recurring, right, you can consider prepaying it. Again, if you were going to pay that in January of next year, you're not going to get the benefit until the following April. But if you pay it, accelerate by even just one day into December 31st of this year, now we get to write it off immediately. It'll reduce your taxes come next April. Um, the, I, I think the one main thing I want to say with respect to accelerating expenses, you know, for um, for property owners, it's, you know, pretty simple, right? We have mortgage interest, we can accelerate, we got property taxes, we can accelerate. A lot of those things are, are, are pretty standard. Uh, we want to be careful of accelerating expenses that are not as, um, what's the word I'm looking for, not as known or secure. So in other words, we don't want to prepay $100,000 to our contractor who's going to rehab a property uh, before the end of the year if we don't have a great relationship with them because, I don't know, we might not hear from them. That never, that never happens. I don't know what you're talking about. And, and, you know, one thing I could think of for realtors that we have, we have dues for mm -hmm. our local MLS. And usually, you know, they say, well, if you pay early, you get a discount. Um, and then a lot of people wait until next year to pay them. Let's say in January. So it's, you get a discount if you pay early, plus you accelerate your expenses. So it probably makes sense just to pay them beforehand. So that's like one example that I could think of. Um, that's, that's a good idea. 
I'm gonna use that. Yeah, and I think it's uh, you can you know go through your finances, right? You look at look back at this past January and February, like what did I pay? What were some big items? Do I expect to have them again? And that might be something you can pay. Another another tip too for those who don't know don't know. I mean, a lot of a lot of people, small businesses, uh, you know, small businesses, they they're they pay tax on a cash basis. So the thought being is that I take a deduction when I actually pay for something. The exception to that for cash basis people is if you if you charge expenses to your credit card. As long as it's charged the credit card by December 31st, it counts as an expense this year, regardless, you know, even if you don't pay the credit card off until January or February next year. So that's something that, uh, you know, we think a lot of people know, but some, you know, we, we go and find out a lot of people actually don't know it. So, yeah, there was actually a question earlier when we were talking about cars. Um, someone had asked, you know, is the depreciation only when you buy a car all cash? Uh, no. So on financed cars, you can still depreciate the purchase price of the car, just like real estate. Right? When we buy rental real estate, we depreciate the purchase price of the building, regardless of what the financing, if I paid all cash or I got, you know, 20% down payment, it's, it's all the same. Um, so that's kind of another example of how this, you know, kind of all works together. So explain depreciation because for a long time, I didn't understand how it works like a, like let's say depreciation of a car. You buy a car this year, you finance it 100%. And then, and then you get to use that bonus depreciation. How, how does that work when it comes to like somebody who is going to net $100,000 in their income? How does that work? Yeah, I mean, for like a realtor, um, you know, kind of the way, you know, I, I, I like to think of depreciation as kind of like the ninth wonder of the world. It's one of those things that the IRS allows you to take write-offs for things that, you know, and maybe in a car example, maybe you've bought a $100,000 car, but you got a loan for the entire thing, right? You're putting zero down. You haven't paid any money out of your own pocket. But if, again, if it's weighs more than 6,000 pounds, you use it 100% of the time for business. In that example, you might be able to take a write-off of eighty, eighty-five thousand dollars $85,000 in the first year. So if you made $100,000, then all of a sudden, instead of being taxed on $100,000, you're only going to be taxed on $20,000 in that example. I mean, that's a huge write-off, uh, you know, tax savings, especially for something where you just borrowed money to buy the asset, right? It works the same way with real estate, too. So, so depreciation, guys, it's basically if you earn $100,000 in this example, and you buy a $100,000 car, and you get to depreciate 80% of that, that means that the IRS, you could legally tell the IRS, hey, I made 100000 but I bought this car, this awesome car, so I really only made 20000 on paper, so I'm just going to pay taxes based on $20,000 income for the year, and you have yourself a brand new awesome car, and the, <laughs> the, it works the same way with real estate, so if you have a big piece of real estate, you buy a piece of real estate, and you make 100000 then all of a sudden, potentially, you could do the same thing where you just bonus depreciate it, and then it goes from, you know, you really made a hundred thousand cash. I mean, that's how much you made, but in the IRS, eyes of the IRS, they say, no, you only made 20,000. Let's say we use that same example, right? So that's crazy. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting um, when you look at the numbers and how things add up. Now on the car example, of course, the assumption is that it's, you know, primarily or in, the, in that example, hundred percent used for business. So if you have some personal use of that car, then the benefit reduces based on how much personal use. Um, but yeah, other than that, it's uh, definitely really important. I, I was saying earlier for realtors, it's very important to consider being a real estate investor because of that depreciation benefit, being able to offset all of that commissions, right? or if not all of it, then at least a big part of it. Um, let's talk about income shifting. This is something we talk about all the time, but especially with respect to year end. Um, income shifting is really a fancy way of saying, hey, how can we incorporate our kids or other family members who are maybe helping us out in our real estate investment or in our real estate business? Um, how can we pay them uh, or hire them to work for us and legitimately take a tax deduction for the money that we paid them, right? And so um, the concept is, hey, instead of just giving, you know, if we have teenage kids and the older they are, the more expensive they are, right? The more expensive needs they have. So if we have- Were, you, were they on the list of high expense items earlier? No, uh, yeah, so that's interesting. Good. We should have to figure out. <laughs> um, so instead of giving your teenager, um, you know, some money for them to spend, have them help out in your real estate business, in your realtor business. And what you can do is pay them a reasonable compensation. That money becomes a tax deduction to you and 
uh, could potentially be free from income taxes. Uh, right now, the first like 13,000 or so is free from income tax. So definitely something to consider. The reason we put this as part of our year end presentation is we always come across people who uh, come to us in like April and say, hey, I heard you talk about income shifting and I wanna do that for last year. Well, remember we talked about what happens before the end of the year is what sticks. So if you have kids that you can use this strategy with, you got to make sure they help you out with your business this year. You got to make sure money is paid to them this year. The documentation of everything occurs this year if you want it to be a strategy for this. Yeah, it's um, when we kind of uh, first started using the slide or this picture in the slide, I was like, oh, that's cool. Like dad's, you know, teaching the kid how to use Excel or something. But nowadays, it's probably the kid teaching dad how to use AI or something like that, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. You get paid for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's go to some real estate investor specific things to talk about for year end. Um, you know, one of the main things for uh, to understand is normally rental real estate, you know, earlier we talked about having losses, right, create depreciation and writing these things off. And so odds are what happens is we have a rental property with good cash flow, but we have losses. And then the question becomes, well, what can we do with those real estate losses from our rental properties? And the answer will depend, the answer is very different from person to person. Um, but for most people who are full-time W-2 workers who are not realtors, right? They just have a W-2 job as a, a CPA or a doctor or something. Um, usually those losses are considered passive losses, which means that they only offset taxes from passive income and they don't really offset taxes from your W-2 income. Um, but for people who are realtors, uh, then it is easier for them to claim real estate professional. And the benefit of someone being a real estate professional is that now your rental losses don't just offset W-2 income, it also offsets your real estate commissions income. And if you're married and have a spouse, it could also offset your spouse's income as well. Yeah. And so, you know, as we're coming up on year end, thinking about, you know, you've got some long-term rental properties looking for ways and maybe, you know, with depreciation, we'll talk about that, right? Is if we can create a loss on those properties and use that to offset 1099 income, W-2 income, whatever other income you have, um, you know, by claiming real estate professional, the, the question is, can I qualify this year, right? Like, so there's a couple of requirements. Uh, it's probably worth just mentioning uh, three requirements to be a real estate professional with respect to your long-term rentals. You need to spend at least 750 hours a year in real estate time. Now that can, that can be time you spend on your properties. That can be time you spend as a realtor, can be other real estate time. So for realtors, it's pretty easy to meet that first threshold, right? right? Because you're already doing real estate. Uh, second test is you have to have more time in real estate than your other job. Now, if you are somebody that is working 1099 in real estate, you have no other job, mute point, obviously. But if you're a, 10, a W-2 worker, um, then, you know, this may be challenging if you're working a full-time job. So 750 hours, more time in real estate than your other job. Third one, just as important, is that you need to meet one of the material participation standards with respect to your own properties. And this, I think, is probably the more difficult one that we see from realtors investing in real estate. I mean, it, there's different different ways to do it, and it's we you know, not enough time to get into all the details, but just kind of know that you more or less have to be kind of managing your own properties, right? Doing a lot of the day-to-day -day legwork with your own respect to your own long-term rentals. Uh, you know, boots on the ground, doing a lot of the stuff um, versus maybe a property manager doing everything for you. But again, if you can meet those requirements and be a real estate professional, create losses on paper for some of these tax strategies, we can use those to offset your other income. So again, bringing it all together, thinking about as we're coming up on year end, where do you stand in respect to meeting those requirements? Start documenting now if you haven't documented for the first, you know, nine months of the year. And keep that log so that as you're, you're you're pushing yourself to kind of meet those requirements before you get to December 31st, because it is the hours are based on a calendar year, right? And so it's you gotta got, gotta be diligent about that. Yeah. So if you like you're a realtor, you started investing in some rental properties this year, you look back at your hours and it's like, hey, I got 750 right across all my real estate stuff but I only have 400 hours with respect to my rentals. And so between now and the end of the year, make sure you earn those additional hours, right? Could be like doing more rehab work or doing more property management stuff or uh, buying another long-term rental property and you know, kind of put it into service. So those are definitely things to consider. 
um, besides the real estate professional status, you know, right now we have a lot more people getting into like midterm rentals and short-term rentals, and there's different loopholes and, and, and different strategies around those. Um, we, we won't cover the details of it because each topic is, you know, kind of another 10 minute discussion there. Um, we'll kind of offer you some additional free resources on that later on. But the key again, with respect to year end is that if you own rental real estate and you're going to create tax losses, make sure you have enough hours to qualify for utilizing these losses against your commission's income, against any other W-2 income of a spouse or something like that. Um, Perfect. And so, yeah, some of you might be like, hey, what, you know, what losses, right? I have a lot of money. So circling back on the whole concept of depreciation, we touched on a little bit earlier with respect to cars. Um, it's even more powerful when we talk about real estate. Yeah, I mean, we gave that example, right, of, you know, you can go out and buy a rental property for all cash, you can buy it for 20% down, you can buy it for 0% down. And when we start talking about depreciation, it's all based on the purchase price. And again, so the idea behind this is it's a, it's a little little loophole the IRS gives you, you know, they let you write off a part of your building every year under the kind of the premise that it's going down in value because of normal wear and tear. Well, obviously, we're hoping we're buying properties are going up in value. But they're going to give us this deduction. We're going to take advantage of it right now. Rental properties, standard rules, we depreciate a building over 27 and a half years. It's a residential rental. Commercial property, you do it over 39 years. So that by itself is great. I mean, you know, you can get thousands of dollars of depreciation every year. But the way you can kind of supercharge it is, you know, look at maybe doing a cost segregation study to take more accelerated depreciation, right? Um, because if we can go into if you can utilize the benefits of the cost sake study, you can go in and get it. What they're doing is they're looking at a building and saying, hey, some of the stuff, instead of writing it off for 27 and a half years, this is really a five-year asset, or this is a 15-year asset, uh, in which by itself means, hey, we get the right to solve over five years or 15 years. But circling back to what we talked about earlier, there's bonus depreciation, right? Those five and 15-year assets are eligible for bonus depreciation. So that could be, that could be a lot of uh, depreciation up front that we can take on those, if we can segregate those assets and break them out of those, those components. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And don't worry if this is like brand new to you and you don't have to memorize how the mechanics. There's going to be a test later. <laughs> you don't have to uh -huh. memorize how the mechanics work or anything. Um, that's something like the CPA, your CPA will be doing. Again, the key is if you have rental real estate, um, then odds are you, you know, if, especially if they're newer, uh, like you have, you didn't purchase them like 10 years ago, uh, odds are you could probably take advantage of accelerated depreciation, but before deciding whether you should do it, it's kind of going back to the previous slide where we talked about, do you have enough hours? Are you going to be able to actually utilize these losses? Um, and that's where kind of the importance of year end comes in. To clear something up, I have a lot of people who ask like, do I have to do this accelerated depreciation before the end of the year? Uh, and thankfully the answer is no. The study itself of breaking out the components of the building, that could be done anytime before you file your tax returns for this year. Um, so we, we don't have to stress about getting that project done. Okay? It could be done as late as next, you know, September or next October. But what we cannot do after year end is buy real estate, right? We have to, if we want it for this year, we got to buy it this year. We got to rent it out this year. We got to have enough hours this year. Those are the three things for year end planning. That's more time sensitive. Yeah, another thing that, you know, thinking about year end coming up, uh, you know, Retirement planning is another favorite topic of ours. We could spend the whole day talking about different retirement planning strategies and things. But with respect to year-end planning, I mean, the thing to think about here is looking at what is yeah, what is your income going to be, and is there uh, you know, is there a different you know, different types of retirement plans you can put in place for your own business to take advantage of it? Now, some of them um, you know need to be some of the plans need to be set up before year end, um, but may not have to be funded by year end. Whereas some of them actually can be set up after year and it's still funded later for this year. So there's there's definitely going to be different different rules depending on what, what fits in your business. But I mean, as realtors, I mean, there's a lot of options, right? There's SEP IRAs, there's, you don't have any other employees or solo 401ks, there's uh, defined benefit plans, which is another huge one for, you know, can be a great strategy for those of you maybe in your 50s and 60s that want to put away more than, you know, the usual 50 or $60,000 you could with a solo 401k. If you're making, you know, we've seen it where, you know, agents make $500,000 and they're, they're dumping $100,000, $150,000 into a defined benefit plan every year. So that the benefit, obviously, is that it's a tax deduction right now. A lot of times you can self-direct those where you can kind of choose what you want to invest in them. So you could 
put those into real estate inside the retirement accounts. So you're kind of getting the best of both worlds. Yeah. I mean, one thing I always, I mean, I tend to ask people is like, Hey, if you have the option to pay to the IRS for next April, or you can put it into a retirement account of your own and let it grow tax deferred for you, what would you prefer? Right. Cause that's really the, the, the deciding. I know, it kind of sounds like a trick question, right? Yeah. It's like, you want to pay the IRS or you want to pay towards your retirement account? Because when you pay to the, the IRS in taxes, you know what the return on investment is, right? It's zero. If you put it into like a 401k as an example, then that's something you can invest in. Like Matt said, you can do real estate, you can do notes. Uh, the, you know, there's a whole slew of assets that you can invest so in. So again, you know, coming up on your end, the, the takeaway here is to sit down with your tax advisor based on your own situation and see what are my options with respect to retirement planning if I go this route, how much can I put in? What is it going to save me? You know, do I have the cash to do it? When do I need to put them on? All those kind of questions, but you don't have to be an expert in it. It's just having that conversation, right? Having the open dialogue to see what are, what are your options? Yeah. And I think like the, what you're mentioning with this, you know, either two options, one is pay the IRS taxes or the second option, pay yourself long-term, right? It's almost like too good to be true. And for everyone out there, it's like, this is real stuff. Um, it's not a scam. Scam, but here's the caveat here is the catch that you actually have to like sit down have a meeting with your cpa you know go over your finances that takes work takes time and it takes commitment so there is a catch and that's like the price you're willing to pay and what's that price well you know maybe you can't watch your favorite netflix series Maybe you have to, you know, spend time on the weekend working through your finances. Number number of participants just dropped off once you yeah. said stop watching Netflix. They're like Netflix, yeah. get out of here. Yeah. They're like, you clown. <laughs> no, but you know, that's the price to pay. So this is real. There is a catch though. It's your time. Yeah. Yep. Everything does take effort. You know, it's not as simple. Uh, I was just thinking about it, right? It's, it's amazing for all of you who are here tonight on the webinar. Take notes, but also take action. Um, and to that extent, we're going to go over tax savings in action. But this is just a fun little slide. New York Times came out with this like a year and a half now, a year and a half ago. They said these evil, wealthy people paid very little taxes. Um, Matt and I dug into that article in full. Basically, this is, this is what we like to do in our yeah, spare time. Yeah. And instead of Netflix, that's what we do. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, a lot of the strategies that they talked about were some of the things that we just discussed tonight, believe it or not. I know uh, Voltaire earlier said, oh, yeah, Amanda, Amanda, they work with, you know, very high income, high caliber uh, tax clients. But the reality is the strategies that we work with people are on the same. Whether you make $100,000 or you make a million dollars or $100 million, the concepts behind everything we talk about is going to be pretty similar, just slightly varied based on the actual income level. Um, but we wanted to put together something real quick. So I do want to save a little bit of time. Maybe we have a couple minutes for Q&A. Yeah. Tax savings in action. Um, so this is an example of a return that we did last year. So you can see somebody who made about 320 of W-2 income. Their spouse was a real estate professional. This is their first year investing in rental real estate. They had about 26,000 of rental income. Did a little bit of income shifting with their kids. Uh, had a little car and home office expenses, nothing crazy, didn't buy a Tesla like Voltaire wants to do. Uh, but the biggest thing for them was the depreciation and cost segregation. You can see because of that, they, with over 340,000 of income, they ended up at only 91,000 for tax purposes. And so that's a, a tax um, deduction of over 254,000. So if you multiply that by your tax rate, that could be what almost $100,000. That could be a down payment on another rental property. So that is the significance of tax planning and, and, and why it's so important for us to all take time. Um, I know we kind of rushed through a lot of these things, try to give you guys as much as possible. Um, like I said, there's a lot more behind the strategies on entity structuring, income shifting, the short-term rental loophole, make sure you scan this QR code. Um, it'll take you to our website where you can download our free tax savings toolkit, um, or you can just go to keystonecpa.com and you can access that at any point in time. So um, we got like five minutes for questions. <laughs> Shall we jump in? Yeah, let's, let's do a speed round of questions if you want to open it up. And um, one question okay. I have that someone texted me is, um, how old do your kids have to be to use them in your business? This is a great question. One we get a lot, uh, they can, 
Uh, it doesn't matter the age. I mean, think about their, their babies getting paid in diaper commercials, obviously, but for everyone else's benefit, what, what you pay them needs to be reasonable for their age, right? So if they are five years old, uh, you know, probably claiming that they're doing all of your AI and chat GPT might be a stretch, right? But uh, maybe not for a 12 year old, no jokes aside, right? I mean, um, but just, it has to be reasonable for what they're doing. You know, what would you pay somebody else's kid who's the same age if, you know, you didn't know them and you were, they were going to, you were going to help you in your business. Right? Yeah. And of course, adhere to labor law rules, right? Yeah. There's child labor laws so or like not doing 55 hour work weeks. Right? Yeah. yeah. We only do that for tax people here, right, right. But, <laughs> but not for your kids. Um, all right. We got one from Carla who, Carla, I think real estate agent with an S corp. And then the question is, should rentals be in a different LLC, same LLC? Do they need payroll? Uh, so Carla, the way it typically works is your S corp will have your commissions income, all the active income, and then your rentals will be in a different LLC or multiple LLCs, right? Where all the rentals will go through payroll from your S corp LLCs. We don't need payroll. If you need money from that cash flow, you just pull it out into a personal. Uh, Jose said, can you use that car rule every year? Um, Talk about bonus depreciation. Yeah, bonus depreciation, buying a new car. Do you need to buy a new car every year? That's a different question, Jose. But um, can you use it every year? Yeah, technically you could. Uh, now, keep in mind, if uh, one of the, there is a, the, the catch here is that, you know, let's say you buy vehicle number one this year, you, you know, use it 80% of the time, 90% of the time for business, do a lot of depreciation right up. Next year, you want to do the same thing. That first vehicle, you still need to use it at least 50% of the time for business in the subsequent years because if it drops below 50% business use, you do need to, um, they call it recapture the previous expenses you took, pick it back up into income. So that'll just be the threshold you want to keep is, you know, you can buy more vehicles and use them for business, but the previous ones, if you did take huge depreciation, you want at least 50% business use yeah. each year. Unless you start running like a Toro operation because now you just have so many yes. cars and so we do have that. We do have clients who you know, end up doing Turo. Uh, okay, Tristan says, can a W-2 employee claim depreciation for the occasional use of the car for work? So uh, unfortunately, no, they took that away a couple of years ago where um, as expenses as a W-2 employee, uh, there's not really any federal tax benefit. So when we were talking about car usage, we are really talking about with respect to you being a realtor or a real estate investor. All right, Jeanette asked, how do you pay, I think you're talking about kids, how do you pay them on a payroll or 1099? Uh, Jeanette, this is going to depend on the, how your business is structured and what you have going on necessarily, but big picture, uh, generally speaking, better to pay them on payroll versus a 1099 because if they're 18 and under, generally speaking, they're not going to have to pay any payroll taxes on that money, uh, whereas if you pay them at a 1099, they may have to pay that payroll or self-employment tax, so could make, make sense to pay them on, as payroll iPhone number four says, can you pay your family member if you're not a real estate professional? Uh, yes. For, so all of the stuff we talked about, right? Uh, writing off your car, writing off your home office, paying your kids, cost segregation, all those are available to everyone, regardless of whether you're a real estate professional or not. Uh, and that's a common misconception. People think, oh, I have to be a real estate professional to do all these things. You don't. Anybody can do it. Now, the question, though, is should you do it? Because if you're not a real estate professional, will you actually get a benefit from paying your kids? Will you actually get a benefit from accelerated depreciation? And that answer is going to be different for every single one of us on this call. All right, iPhone 3. I mean, Matthew says, uh, <laughs> when writing off depreciation, it also offset your income, for, for example, to be able to, I'm guessing it means maybe qualify for loans. That, that's a question we get a lot is like, if you're taking a bunch of these deductions, does it affect my ability to qualify for loans? Uh, and, you know, we have this conversation a lot with investors and clients. Obviously, it could, um, but not if you're working with the right mortgage broker or lender. So the, the key being you want to work with mortgage brokers who understand, have experience working with real estate investors, because uh, if they are good, they're going to be able to, hey, well, that's depreciation expense. That shouldn't count against your, you know, your ratios and all that good stuff, right? It shouldn't hurt your ability to qualify for loans. The other thing, too, is that if you're working with good mortgage brokers or lenders, um, send them a draft of your tax return, right? Before you finalize it, before you file it. Uh, that way they can take a look at it and go, hey, yeah, you're good to go here. Or maybe we tweak things. Maybe we don't take this deduction or that deduction. And then you have the, the pros and cons to think about, right? I think this uh, last question I think is for you, Voltaire says, how can we access the recording? We're going to have it on our YouTube and it's going to live there forever. So just give us a couple of days and it'll be on there. Forever. Access. Forever and ever, no. Um, so, 
Um, yeah, and I got that text message from different people too. So I really appreciate you guys. Again, um, by the way, are you guys taking on new clients? Uh, should they just go to their website to find out or what's the best way? Yeah, uh, just visit our website at keystonecpa.com. Um, you can schedule a free consultation with our team. And basically what um, the goal in that is to figure out what you have going on, what your needs are, and then help determine if we would be a good fit to help you. Um, so our team is really good about asking those like the right questions and stuff like that. And if we're not a good fit, um, we typically have a good sense of who might be a good fit. And so we can send uh, referrals as well. Right. And by, by the way, guys, you or your clients could hire them, you know, to do your tax planning. And then you take that plan and you take it to your accountant and they could do it, the, your tax returns. And we'll just do one last question. Osvaldo asked if you sell a home and ownership is as joint tenants, not married couple, not married couple, is exemption rule 250K per individual. Yeah, if you were joint tenants, you're not married, then uh, yeah, each of you would be permitted to use, exclude up to 250, uh, assuming you met the other rules, obviously. But. Awesome. Thank you. And so a reminder, if you found this helpful, useful, uh, you got some type of value, please leave us a five-star review with positive comments. There in the link is our Google page. If you could just go there, that'd be awesome. And also look up Matt McFarlane and Amanda Hahn, and you can leave them a five-star review with positive comments and actually for extra for for extra credit you could just write in there that uh matt's jokes were very funny <laughs> that's it that's what I, that's what I, that's my my whole uh my whole goal in life my stupid <laughs> jokes are funny no they're good they're really good and then um the last question one more Luis said asked do, do rental properties only apply to properties in the u.s uh yeah i think maybe the question was do like the cost segregation or bonus depreciation right. so the rental strat property, strat these yeah strategies i mean the strategies are, are all the same uh us or abroad there is a difference when it comes to depreciation though if we have foreign properties uh you can still do cost segregation but they're not eligible for bonus depreciation so that's wow. the kind of the main difference i didn't know that one cool perfect all right. Well, hey, look, it's already 730. We won't take it past here. Thank you very much, Amanda and, and Matt. I really appreciate you guys doing this for our entire community. And again, guys, please thank them. Leave them a five-star uh, review with positive comments, uh, us as well. Thank y'all. Peace. Thanks, Voltaire. Thanks, everybody. Good night.